Welcome to NCSS Here For You. For over 50 years, Northwestern Counseling and Support Services has been providing access to quality psychosocial services to the residents of Franklin and Grand Isle counties. Over the years, as the needs of the community have changed, so too have the programs and services that we make available to assist children, adolescents, adults, families, and seniors. We take our role in the community seriously and we strive to provide the highest quality services. According to Eric Erickson, a noted developmental psychologist, every person must pass through a series of eight interrelated stages over the entire life cycle. NCSS provides a continuum of services to meet the needs of individuals who at any point seek assistance. NCSS's purpose is creating a stronger community one person at a time. Now, let's get to today's show. I'm Joe Halko, Director of Community Relations for Northwestern Counseling and Support Services, and welcome to another episode of NCSS Here For You. Each month on this program, we discuss a human services topic, and we do that with staff from one of our three service divisions. Our three service divisions are Behavioral Health Services, Children, Youth, and Family Services, and Developmental Services. And on occasion, we have a guest from organizations that NCSS collaborates with throughout the year. This month's episode is titled, Child and Family Traumatic Stress Intervention Treatment Program. The Child and Family Traumatic Stress Intervention Treatment Program was developed by the Yale University School of Medicine and Child Study Center. The program is provided by mental health professionals at NCSS who have received specialized training in this evidence-based treatment. Today, we'll discuss the importance of this treatment model for children or youth together with a parent or caregiver relative to a traumatic event. I'd like to welcome this month's guest, Samantha Thomas, Children's Initial Response Team Leader. Sam, welcome to the program. Thank you, Joe. So the uh, Child and Family Traumatic Stress Intervention Treatment Program was developed by Yale University School mm -hmm. of Medicine and the Child Study Center. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you begin using this treatment model at NCSS? It was actually just just over a year ago, uh, last March. Mm -hmm. uh, we went down to Lake Maury and uh, did an intensive training um, with a woman from Yale. And um, after that training, we were able to start using the treatment intervention. And we then engaged in a learning collaborative, mm -hmm. um, which has been really successful at NCSS when we've been able to bring in new models of treatment. Uh, we then spoke with Carla Stover um, via phone um, twice a month to really talk about the work that we were doing, how the model was going for us, troubleshooting, mm -hmm. um, and just really um, deepening our knowledge of this treatment. And if you could explain, what is the Child and Family Traumatic Stress Intervention Treatment Program? And sure. Uh, so what it is, is it's really quite exciting. Um, it's very new uh, to our community. Um, and it's a brief, and by brief I mean about four to six sessions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really aimed for kids who have experienced a traumatic event. Um, and that traumatic event can be anything. Um, uh, loss of a parent, um, witnessing violence in the community, um, being in an accident. Um, it's really, there's a really broad scope of traumatic events because what we know is that different events impact individuals differently. Sure. And so we want to be able to be responsive to the wide range of, of traumatic events that can, can occur for kids. Mm -hmm. And when I am going to ask my next question, which you've partially answered, mm -hmm. but who can benefit? It's the child, but it's also as well, as well as the parent and or caregiver as well, isn't it, as far as this whole model is concerned? Yep. absolutely, and that's another thing that I very much like about this model. We have a number of services at NCSS where we include families and we encourage parents and families to be involved in treatment, and sometimes it's really difficult because our families have very busy lives and they've got a lot going on and it can be difficult to prioritize at times, and with this program, um, we really can't move forward unless um, a caregiver or caregivers um, are present. Um, and so 
it's, it's really helpful that we really just can't move forward. We really need to have mom, dad, grandma, whoever mm -hmm. those folks are, the primary caregivers involved, supporting this youth to be able to process what's gone on for them and to be able to understand how it impacts them mm -hmm. um, and those pieces. And we serve kids seven to 18. Um, and the reason for the age cutoff is um, we use a lot of assessment tools. So <clears throat> we wanna make sure that we're working with kids who are old enough to be able to sure. answer those types of questions and do that in a verbal way. You know, our agency has a lot of services for younger kids, mm -hmm. um, but this program in particular, um, we really need kids who can um, report out on their experience and what's going on for them. Um, and um, we've had a lot of kids younger um, than seven that we look at some alternative programming for. Yeah, um, and I think one of the things that's really important is that our caregivers learn so much from this intervention model. So our kids were working to reduce symptoms mm -hmm. and our parents were really working to educate and have them understand how to be the best support they can to their children because a traumatic event can really turn you know, lives upside down for a bit. Sure. And um, you know, kids really need caregivers to be on top of it and to be, uh, to be there. And this can really help out uh, with those families. I think one thing that's important is a lot of people ask about our services and how do you qualify for our services, mm -hmm. what criteria do you have to meet, and really with this program, um, a youth just has to be displaying one more symptom than they were displaying prior to the event, um, and that can be a range of, uh, of symptoms, sleeplessness, um, sleep disturbance, uh, any depression, anxiety anything like that. So the threshold is really, really low. Um, and the intention is really to be able to capture um, as many kids as we can and help them to process mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever event has happened for them. And what are the goals of mm -hmm. the um, Child and Family Traumatic Stress Intervention Treatment Program? So, you know, I understand what you've said as far as who gets involved and why and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. but from a goal standpoint. Sure. Yeah, so one of the things that we know that happens is when kids go through a traumatic event, really when anyone goes through a traumatic event, um, we can develop certain symptoms in the mental health world, and we call those post-traumatic symptoms. Mm -hmm. And the overarching goal of this program is to reduce any of those symptoms that have arisen or um, really inhibit any further symptom development. Um, and so we might have kids who um, you know, come into our treatment with a couple of symptoms and we want to offer some support so that they don't um, gather any additional symptoms or those symptoms don't worsen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really the, the biggest piece. But there's also a lot of assessment that happens um, in the, this model and that can be really helpful in us identifying with that youth and that family. If this is the service that they need and that's all that they need, or if they really need some ongoing support, um, some longer term treatment. Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of this, it could very well be that um, a youth resolves their symptoms, parents feel really good and they can move on, or they might need some additional support. So we're working hard as we're providing this intervention to be assessing whether or not this youth and family need to continue on in an, addi an additional treatment modality. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now how does the treatment program itself work? Mm. So with our goal being reducing symptoms, mm -hmm. we do that in two ways. Uh, one of them is increasing communication between the youth and their caregiver. Um, I think a lot of people know that when we don't talk about things, when we bottle them up inside, we're not really working on them and we're not resolving them. We don't know how else they're gonna come out. And that's really important uh, for us to know with our kids that we're working with, particularly after a traumatic event, that it's important for them to be able to talk about what's happened to them, talk about how they're feeling, so they can get the support of those important people in their lives. <clears throat> and the other thing is that parents really need to understand how to support their kids um, because parents can be impacted can be impacted um, by whatever traumatic event their kid has gone through as well. So it's important for the parents to understand um, how that event has impacted their kids, how it's impacted them, and just really having that awareness so that they can be as supportive as they can be um, to their child um, because it can be really hard Traumatic events can really um, rock families at times, and, and we really want to make sure that everybody's talking about what's going on for themselves. Um, 
And then <clears throat> the other piece is really about coping skills. You know, I, we, we do a lot of work in mental health <coughs> around coping skills. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we do some pretty focused work um, in different symptom areas, depending on what the youth is experiencing. Um, you know, we identify with the child and the family, um, what is the most disruptive, um, what's kind of getting in the way of, you know, typical functioning. And that's what we really focus on initially. And we kind of develop some of those coping skills. Oftentimes we'll practice them um, when we're all together. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit strange, you know, to practice something new, um, sure. particularly kids, it can be a little bit uncomfortable. So it's kind of nice to, to get the parent in on it and have them practice with us so that our kids are understanding that these are really helpful things to do and it doesn't have to feel weird and uncomfortable um, and strange. So mm -hmm. it's really about increasing that communication and developing some really solid coping skills to move forward. Now, the program itself, uh, I've been told, has a number of sessions involved. Mm -hmm. And can you explain the differences in the sessions and also who's involved in these sessions? Because my understanding is it's not <coughs> always everyone yeah, that's everyone. that's involved in each. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. So um, it's typically about four to six weeks of intervention. Mm -hmm. And that first week, we're meeting with the parents. Um, so I would meet with um, whoever that parent is, if we've got two parents in a home and they're able to, to make the time to meet with mm -hmm. me. Um, I really like to have that. That's always really helpful. Um, and so what I'm getting at in that first session is understanding the parent's perspective about the event. I'm learning about how the parents are impacted by the event and trying to be helpful to them in that moment. Um, and then I'm learning about how the parent sees the youth responding to that event. Um, and that's really, really important for the next session for me to get an understanding of what the parent is seeing and, and what they're thinking is going on for their kid. Um, and parents do a really great job of um, knowing their kids and knowing what's going on for them. So they're, they're really good reporters and they give me that first sense of, of what's going on for, for a youth. I do ask some questions about the parent's history. Um, and sometimes parents wonder why I ask those questions. And <clears throat> it's really about, you know, we know that our past influences our present. And sometimes we've had traumatic experiences adult, as adults. And those might be influencing how we're experiencing and thinking about what's happened for our kids. Sure. So I'm asking some questions of parents to get a sense of, of that past. Um, and that's really the gist of it. I think parents, um, at least in my experience with the families that I've worked with, um, they found it really helpful to spend that time with me first, mm -hmm. just them, because they can be really kind of open and honest about what their concerns are sure. um, yeah. for their child. And, and they get, they're also really honest about what their kids' strengths are. You know, And that's something that I'm really interested in hearing about in that first um, meeting as well is, what's going well? What are you surprised is going well? What are those things that are, um, that are really positive that I can build on, that we can take and, and work on so that you know, we can help this kid get through this time? Um, and I think that's a nice piece uh, of this model as well, because I think it can be hard in tough times to think about what is positive. Um, and being able to hold on to those and build on those is really an important part of this, of this program. Um, so that's session one, and that's usually about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a brief intervention as far as number of visits or meetings, um, but they can be a little bit lengthy, the first two sessions in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and in the, that first session, I'm using a fair amount of assessment tools, so I'm asking a lot of questions. Um, and from that point, we schedule um, session two, which is kind of comes in two parts. Um, and that's the longest of the sessions. That's definitely an hour and a half, sometimes two. So sometimes we'll split it up into two different visits mm -hmm. just to not overwhelm the youth, sure. mm -hmm. particularly depending on age. If we have a real, you know, little one, a seven-year-old, um, sometimes we'll split it over two weeks just to make sure that they're not saturated mm -hmm. um, with the meeting. Um, and so that first meeting, uh, the first part of it, I'm meeting with the youth and I'm asking very similar questions that I asked the parents, um, asking them about um, how they're feeling since whatever the traumatic incident was. Um, and we also do some psychoeducation. So we're talking to kids about, you know, what does happen to kids um, when they're um, impacted by traumatic events and trying to normalize some typical reactions because some kids 
if they haven't experienced anything like that. They wonder if they're weird mm -hmm. um, or if they're strange. And that moment can be really nice to just, just to normalize it a little bit for them. And it, sometimes it makes them just a little bit more comfortable to continue to mm -hmm. participate. Um, and so I spend about 45 minutes with the youth and then we come back together and I've asked a bunch of questions of the parents and I've asked a bunch of questions of the kid and then we sit down either all three of us or all four of us depending on the number of caregivers mm -hmm. um, involved and we really look at and I actually have the assessment tools out in front of me and the responses and we look at where they are the same, where they match up, and where they're different. Um, and so oftentimes I'll talk about those places where they're the same, that the youth is doing a great job being open about what they're experiencing, or the parent is doing a great job really honing in and being aware of what's going on for their, uh, for their child. And those places where they're different, that's when we start to figure out why are they different? You know, is there a communication piece that's missing? Um, is the youth nervous or fearful um, around sharing this piece with their parents or have they just not thought to share it mm -hmm. you know with their parents so that's kind of that pivotal point in this treatment program where we really start to get into increasing the communication um, and then at that point i work with the family to identify are there symptom areas that are the most distressing and we start talking about coping skills and um, we'll kind of dig into them a little bit like i said we'll practice them a little bit um, and uh, sometimes i have to act a little bit silly you know just <laughs> to make it seem like it's okay you know <laughs> to to try something new um, and then we make a plan to meet for the next week and talk about um, how to use those skills in the interim um, and uh, i have a little um, family handout that can be very helpful. Some families really enjoy having some structure that they can kind of take note throughout the week, what they experienced, and if they used any particular coping skills, if they were helpful or not helpful. Um, and so that's session two, and like I said, it could be one visit or, or two, depending, two. On, depending on what's going on. And, and then the final two sessions um, are really following up on how did it go this week? You know, since we last met, we, you know, talked about some things maybe you guys haven't talked about together before. We practiced some tools. Um, how did that pan out? Um, so we'll have a discussion about that, but we'll also review some of those assessment tools. Um, and so there's a lot of the same questions that I'm asking every week, which helps me to gauge how the family is doing, how the child's doing, and if there's any development of new symptoms, because we know that that can happen. Um, and so I want to keep track of how that's going as well. Um, and it's pretty much this, the same structure for session three and session four. Um, and in session four, we're talking about, um, do we feel good about being done? Do we need to have maybe one more meeting just to kind of cement some things, another week to practice some of the skills? Mm -hmm. um, do we need to think about ongoing treatment? Um, are there referrals that we need to make? Because maybe there's a little bit more additional work beyond this program that would be helpful to the family. Um, or are they good? Do they feel like it was really successful um, and get what they needed? Um, so it's really nice that there are just multiple ways for this program to end. Um, and then, you know, we look at some of the other services that are out there if they need to be um, ongoing. And that actually leads me to, you know, we talk so often about no matter what treatment is being provided to someone at NCSS, every single individual has an individual plan of care. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's not as if even though you're dealing with a specific type of a treatment model, it, it doesn't mean that everybody falls into the same, you know, uh, uh, cookie cutter scenario. Right, exactly. Each individual, mm -hmm. depending on their circumstances and situation, is very individualized to their needs and absolutely. to moving forward. Um, yep, yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, this program is a good example of that. You know, the overarching goal is to reduce symptoms, but mm -hmm. every youth is going to come in with different symptoms and we're going to be using different coping skills because different ones work better for, sure. for different individuals. So sure. it's a little bit of a microcosm, I guess, mm -hmm. of, you know, the larger agency because then, you know, if we're moving on, um, then an next provider knows what we worked on and they may need to tweak some of the goals. They might have resolved some of them and need to continue mm -hmm. to work on some additional symptoms, uh, but it is... Uh, very, very individualized mm -hmm. um, in the treatment. Yeah. 
And speaking of coping skills, um, certainly those skills for anxiety are so critical and, mm -hmm. and important. Um, can you discuss some of the skills that are learned in yeah. greater detail? Sure. So I think that one of the most basic coping skills that I think we forget about um, just in day to day when we're stressed out is breathing. Mm -hmm. And it seems so silly. You know, we do and it. And simple, you, but right? yeah. I mean, we're doing overlooked. it right now. Um, <laughs> and, but you can breathe the right way and you can breathe the wrong way. And particularly when people are anxious, you can get really shallow mm -hmm. breathing, um, which does not help to calm the body. And we know that um, a calm body and a calm mind, they're just the best mm -hmm. match. And um, so I usually start with breathing. And some kids have maybe had some experience with a guidance counselor at school and they're like, oh yeah, I know about mm -hmm. belly breathing, you know. Yeah. Um, and so if they do, great, you know, we'll practice it a little bit and we'll move on to the next. Um, or if they haven't, we really kind of get into it. And, you know, depending on how old uh, the kids are, um, the teenagers, um, you know, oftentimes I'll have them practice and put their hand on their stomach mm -hmm. and put their hand on their chest and, um, you know, feel which hand raises. And if their belly hand raises, then they're doing a proper deep belly breath. Um, with little kids, they really like um, breathing buddies. And so you get a stuffed animal and um, you lay down on the ground and you put the stuffed animal on your belly and you breathe in and you can kind of, you know, when the stuffed animal goes See up you. and down, you know you're doing it right. Um, so little kids, mm -hmm. you know, really like that. Um, and so, and that can be a little bit awkward, you know, particularly for the older kids that are a little bit uncomfortable, but, you know, I'll engage the parents um, or the caregivers to help um, and practice themselves. Um, I'll practice that with them, model it a little bit. Um, and, you know, we just talk about using those deep um, belly breaths to just calm the body. Um, one other thing that we do a lot is just another step to calm the body. And Again, we kind of do it age appropriately. Um, but for older kids, we'll do progressive muscle relaxation. Um, and so we'll sit and we'll practice some of our breathing. So we'll get into a good rhythm uh, with breathing. And then we'll start with maybe our hands. And so I'll ask them to squeeze their hands really tight. Um, and hold that for five seconds and then let it go. And as I'm kind of working with them through that initially, I'm asking them to think about how their hands feel mm -hmm. um, and how that release feels. And so we might do that um, up the arms or, or in the legs um, and just getting that experience of that real tension and that release. Um, it helps kids to just get some control over their bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, little kids, that doesn't really do anything for them. Um, little kids like um, toy soldier and wet noodle so they stand really stiff like a toy soldier and then you know get really loose, loose like a wet noodle <laughs> yeah. um, and they really like that and, and sometimes with the little kids that can be really helpful for parents you know in that time uh, between sessions for them to say hey tin soldier wet noodle you know um, and that can kind of help cue kids a little bit um, to if they're in an anxious moment or mm -hmm. they're experiencing some symptoms just to help bring their bodies back into a calm space. Um, and so it seems so basic, you yeah, know, but, yet. <laughs> but when we're anxious and we're worked up, we don't think about those things. Sure. Um, sure. So just really kind of getting back to those basic pieces. And we talk a lot as well about get, returning to natural routines. Sometimes traumatic events can um, upset what's going on, you know, for a kid. Uh, maybe there's an injury um, and so some things are, are going on and they have to change their routines or definitely around sleep patterns. Mm -hmm. um, we're often encouraging using some coping skills, but um, helping our kids get back to sleeping in their room, own rooms if they're sleeping with their parents and just trying to get back to some normalcy um, as best as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are some really, really important pieces. Um, to working with kids and, and working on those coping skills. That's, that's great. Yeah. Now, uh, as an evidence-based early intervention, mm -hmm. does the Child and Family Traumatic Stress Intervention Treatment Program fill a gap? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we have, um, we've been working on trauma-informed care um, at our agency for a long time. And we've done a lot of really good work. And where this program really nicely fits in, it's kind of between that acute crisis response and longer term treatment. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we'll have something go on and um, we'll be able to intervene 
not not right in that moment, right when it happens. Usually our crisis staff might be getting that, um, but they'll refer to us and then we can catch that pocket between the crisis response and a longer term treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that can be a little bit tricky to, to get so quickly into a family, but because it's a brief model, we're able to keep meeting with new families. And I would imagine that as we begin to do this program longer and longer, you really see a lot of uh, outcomes and results whereby mm -hmm. uh, it's so critical that that gap is filled mm -hmm. because if there's too much of a duration from the event to somebody either deciding to or actually seeking some mm -hmm. assistance a lot can happen in between there that yeah. can be uh, I would seem to think be deemed as negative yeah, well, I think sometimes if we don't intervene soon enough, sometimes some of those symptoms can be, become behavioral patterns, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and those behavioral patterns can be tough to break. Um, so when we, if we're able to get in there in those first four to six weeks, we're able to identify um, where the struggles are and to provide some alternatives, because we never want to take away um, a behavior in reaction to a traumatic event because a lot of times behaviors are just the way that kids are trying to cope mm -hmm. and so we don't want to take away a coping skill without giving them a new coping skill sure. um, and I think that when we're able to do it in that time frame it's very helpful. So, uh, so Sam where can viewers get more information about this program? Um, Sure. If they're interested. Yeah, they can give me a call. Um, they can call me at our line 524-6555 um, and ask for Samantha Thomas. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody about it. And um, I've been to a couple of schools and I've been talking to folks and I've had folks call and say, hey, I think this is right. And we just kind of hash it out. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm happy to hear any calls and figure out if it's a good fit for a family. Okay. Well, believe it or not, our time uh, for this month is up. I want to thank my special guest, Samantha Thomas, for being on the show today and sharing her insights on the Child and Family Traumatic Stress Intervention Treatment Program at NCSS. This program certainly can make a difference when implemented immediately following a potentially traumatic event or disclosure of physical or sexual abuse. I also want to thank you, the viewer, for spending time with us again this month. You can learn more about NCSS in all of our programs and services by logging on to ncssinc.org. I'm Joe Halko and I'll be back next month with another episode of NCSS here for you. This has been another episode of NCSS here for you. We hope that you found today's discussion informative and educational. For over 50 years, Northwestern Counseling and Support Services has been providing access to quality psychosocial services to the residents of Franklin and Grand Isle counties. Over the years, as the needs of the community have changed, so too have the programs and services that we make available to assist children, adolescents, adults, families, and seniors. Thanks once again for tuning in this month. NCSS's purpose remains creating a stronger community, one person at a time.